Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning we begin a new sermon series titled Discipleship Directives, the four D's of discipleship, 2 Timothy, whatever you want to call it. It's something about discipleship, a lot about Jesus, and using the book of 2 Timothy. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, discipleship is one of my favorite words, uh, one of my favorite things to talk about in church, um, and I have my own definition for it. It's one of those funny things that the Bible doesn't define specifically. We have all these different definitions floating out there. Some say learner, some say follower, some call it an apprentice. Uh, my definition of discipleship is simple. Maybe not so simple, but to me it's simple. The process of being transformed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. The process of being transformed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. To me, that's really what discipleship is all about. And so Paul is writing a letter to his young protege, Timothy, who is a pastor, uh, or at least their version of a pastor, and he's telling him to stick with it. Be a good disciple. And so what we're going to do is we're going to dive into 2 Timothy. So if you have your Bible, I'd encourage you to open up your Bible to 2 Timothy. If you don't have your Bible, I'm going to encourage you to bring it with you because we're going to be in 2 Timothy over the next several weeks. Um, And so 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul writes this letter and he says, Hey, Timothy, your life ain't going to be that easy. Essentially, that's what he says. He starts off and he says, Hey, Timothy, grace, mercy, and peace are yours. As I mentioned when we started our series on 1 Timothy, the only letters that Paul starts with the words grace, mercy, and peace are letters written to the pastoral types. Everybody else gets grace and peace. It's only the pastoral type letters that get mercy because we mess up enough that we need the mercy is pretty much what that boils down to. So he says, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father in verse 2 and our Lord Jesus Christ guard the deposit entrusted to you. So he's going to go for the next couple of verses, and he's going to say, now listen, you were given a great gift. In your childhood, in your upbringing, you were given an amazing gift, and that gift was the gift of faith. And he talks about his grandma, and he talks about his mom, just like Maddie talked about her grandma in the children's message this morning. He he remembers the things that even Paul remembers the things that Timothy's grandma would have taught Timothy. That's pretty big. That's pretty good stuff. So this legacy has been built. I would encourage you to find those people that have given their faith to you who have taught you faith and brought you up in that, in that part of faith, and tell them what that means if you're able to. Tell them what it means to be brought up in the faith if you still have the chance, because that's a really important thing to share with those people who have shared with you. But we're going to jump ahead now to verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. This is kind of where we're going to launch things in our time together this morning. He says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Fan into flame. Have you ever uh, been to a campfire, had a campfire, been to a campground where there's a fire and had a fire pit in your backyard? And have you ever had um, a a child walk up and do something that created an an immense amount of wind near that that fire that caused the fire to go... And all the sparks to go everywhere? I'm that kid at every fire. I love to take a cardboard box and and do one of these and wave it at the fire because it it stirs it and it keeps it moving and just gets the flames bigger and it goes everywhere and it's annoying. That's part of my job, to be annoying. Derek, annoying, whatever. Fan into flames. So, so picture this in your mind. Picture a fire pit. Picture the fire going and and it's, it's burning strong. But then picture somebody coming up and waving something to create a breeze into that fire. Picture that fire starting to to build and roar and spark and grow. This This is what Paul is drawing a picture of here in our text this morning. He says, For this reason, Timothy, because because grandma and mom and everybody before you gave you a good foundation of faith, You need to make sure that you're fanning that faith into flame. 
Now, this is an important thing for us to understand. We have two different words that we use in the church. We use two words. They're really big churchy words, and I'll try and define what they are. We have the word justification, and we have the word sanctification, right? So we have the word, the, the justification means I'm saved. Sanctification means I live like it, basically. And so you've got this this idea of justification. So what what Paul is telling Timothy is he's saying, hey, Timothy, son, your mom and your grandma taught you everything you need to know to be saved. But just because you know that you're saved, just because you know Jesus lived, died, and rose for you, doesn't mean you're going to live like it. Because sometimes you forget. Sometimes you surround yourself with people who don't breathe oxygen into your fire, but who starve your fire of oxygen. I don't know if you've ever been around one of those people who just kind of like sucks the life out of the room. That's kind of what he says, is don't let your faith be surrounded by people with, who suck the life out of your faith. So fan into flame the gift of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. Fan this thing into flame. Surround yourself with these people. Another illustration, another image that you can put in your mind, maybe you're not a fire kind of person like I am, but maybe you're a sports person. So think about sports for a minute. This is like the idea of working out or completing or getting to the very end. Right? Don't give up until you get to the very end. One of the funniest things, I think, is when I watch a football game and the person with the ball who's running toward the end zone doesn't pay attention to where they are. Have you ever seen that? Where they're running down and like they, they've got it. There's nobody near them. They've got the ball tucked and secured and they've outrun everybody and there's the goal line and in a moment of, I got this, they just drop the ball. A foot too short of the goal line. And they didn't complete what they were called to complete. So Paul is telling Timothy, listen, buddy, listen, son, you need to complete that which was started. You need to finish this thing. You need to run all the way across the goal line. You need to fan into flame this spark of fire that was placed inside of you. Don't let anyone suck the oxygen out of your fire. Don't let anyone suck the love of God out of your faith. Fan into flame the gift of God that is yours in Christ Jesus through the laying on of my hands. Now we move into verse 7, and this is a great one, right? So verse 7, For God gave us a spirit not of fear. Now there's a couple different words for fear, three of them actually. And and there's three different kinds of fear that we can worry about. There's, There's the good fear, right? This is the fear, we we talked about it in the early service, of of, um, this is the fear of, I don't touch the stove for fear that I might burn myself, right? If you've got one of those flat top stoves in your house that doesn't have the cool little light button that says hot, you don't just walk up and go, you, or I I iron my own shirts and I I like to make sure that, that the shirts are ironed right, are pressed right, and so I turn it on and I wait for it to get warm enough, and then, do you, do you know what I do to, before I t- try to use it? I lick my fingers and see if it sizzles. I don't know, part of me is I just like the sizzle sound. But this is this, is this idea, I, that's a healthy fear. It's a, it's a fear that says, I'm not just going to put my hand on the bottom of the iron because that would be dumb. That's a smart fear. That's a good fear. Then there's this second fear that's kind of in the middle, which is a little bit of healthy and a little bit of unhealthy. So to understand the second fear, we've got to go to the third one. The third kind of fear is the completely and totally irrational fear. This is the cowardly moment. This is the one that the world calls you a sissy or, or something worse, right? And so you, this is the cowardly fear that says, I'm not going to do anything. This is the fear that says, because I don't know the answer, because I'm afraid of what might actually happen, even though I have no justification that it might, I'm not going to do it. This was the fear I had as a kid, afraid of the dark. It was a totally irrational type of fear. I was afraid there was something under my bed, not because there was ever anything under my bed that I didn't put there, but because I had some weird irrational thing in my head that said there was something there. It's the reason why I I don't go on boats that I can't control. If they won't let me near the control room, I'm probably not going to spend a lot of time on it because I kind of had this issue of I want to know where I'm going and determine where I'm going. It's an irrational fear. 
And so what Paul says is, God gave us not a spirit of irrational fear. God gave us not a spirit of timidity and cowardice and this irrational type of fear, but rather he gave us a spirit of power and love and self-control. Power is our word dynamite. He gave us an explosive kind of faith. He gave us a faith that can walk into a room and just blow the roof off the building. Have you ever met somebody who, who was obviously a follower of Jesus and their faith just exploded when you saw them? Like, you just knew beyond a shadow of a doubt when you came into their presence, this is a person who knows Jesus. Right? This is what Paul says. God gave us a spirit of power, this explosive dynamic. That's our first D, dynamic. God gave us a dynamic faith. There's a, there's a camp song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. We do a lot of bushel hiding with our faith, don't we? I mean, like, we don't want to be that dynamite person very often. Because we're afraid of what, what happens if the world knows I'm a dynamite person? What happens if the person around me, this friend of mine or this coworker or whatever, what happens if they know that I'm a person who loves Jesus? They might not like me anymore. Paul says, God gave us not a spirit of timidity, not to hide our light under a bushel, not to, to cower in fear, but rather of power and love and self-control. Power, trusting in the, in the power and presence of God. Love, I love you enough to not let you stay where you are. I love you enough to get down into the muck and the mire and the dirty, gross, nasty stuff in your day, but I also love you enough to celebrate with you when everything's going great and to be there when nobody else will. I love you enough to correct, your, correct you when you're wrong. I love you enough to curb you back in when, when it seems like you might have lost your way. It says that God's given us a spirit of power and this agape, amazing, unconditional love and self-control. Self-control doesn't mean that I rein it in all the time, but self-control means that, that my context doesn't override my calling Self-control, I understand that what God has called me to is greater than the world around me currently. My context will never outdo my calling. God has called me to be his child. God has called me to live under him in faith and hope and love. God has called me to live a different kind of life than everybody around me, and he wants me to live with this control, this self-control that follows him regardless of what happens in life. If we're going to kind of summarize this entire thing in a simple phrase, it's that salvation is a reminder and a motivator uh, to persist in faith. It's a reminder and a motivator to endure through hard times. Paul is telling Timothy all of these things. But it's important to know where he is when he's telling him. Paul is writing from prison. But not just any prison. He's writing from prison under the rulership of Nero just shortly before he dies. This is what we believe is the last recorded letter of Paul. And he's writing knowing he's about to be beheaded, knowing he's going to die. He's imprisoned not because he was a thief or a murderer, not because he broke the law, but rather because he wouldn't shut up about his faith. He's imprisoned because he had a spirit of power and love and self-control, and he knew that he had to follow God rather than men. And he's going to die. And he says, Timothy, as your father in the faith, as your brother in Christ, God didn't give us a spirit of, of timidity and fear and of cowardice, but rather of power and love and self-control. Because there's something you need to know. He's telling us to have a dynamite kind of faith. He, go, he goes on in verse 8. If you're following along in your Bibles, verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the gospel. Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Nor of me, his prisoner. But share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Don't be ashamed for the testimony of Christ. Don't be ashamed to, to proclaim this is what you believe. Unfortunately, we don't do this often enough. 
This morning, uh, I want you to picture, and I would have done this, but I don't have, I didn't bring any lighters with me this morning, and I, I got to make sure it works the way it does in the video online before I actually do this in person, but so try it at home and tell me if it works. Um, kids, let your parents try this at home. Don't, don't play with fire. Um, or immature adults. Let a mature adult play with fire on your behalf. Um, so, so get two lighters and light one then light the other. They light well. Then t- let go of the little thumb trigger and drop one of those standard lighters in a glass of water and let it sit for a second. Pull that lighter that was in water back out again and try to light it. It won't light. But light the one that was dry and push the thumb trigger of gas on the one that was in the water and watch how the one that wasn't submerged can light the other one. The idea is this, when you fan into flame, when you surround yourself with people who are people of great power and love and self-control, people who have faith that is dynamic and loving of God and willing to not be ashamed of the testimony of Christ, your flame might light someone else's fire. And then fan it. Surround yourself with the people who are not timid and cowardly in their faith, but rather people who are willing to boldly and loudly and without fear proclaim to anyone they meet about the love of Jesus. Now, please understand, I know that everybody is not that kind of a person. Not everybody is the person with a bullhorn standing on the street corner yelling at everyone that Jesus loves them, and that's not what I'm saying. That's not what Paul's driving us to understand. If you read these words from Paul, combine them with our gospel reading from Luke 17, you'll realize that that faith the size of a mustard seed can move a mulberry bush into the water. Faith, it's just, it's not the size of your faith. It's the one in whom your faith is placed. And so Paul says, your faith is not weak. Your faith is not timid. Your faith is not fearful because the one in whom you place it is not weak or timid or fearful. I've tried to move trees with my words. I must just not have that kind of faith. Or perhaps I'm doing it for the wrong reasons because I don't want to dig the hole. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. There's a thing you can do when you're, when you're a, a witness in court. You can plead the fifth. You cannot give your testimony. You can just refuse to say what you know. A testimony that's not given is useless. And so what Paul is telling Timothy, don't be afraid to give your testimony. Don't be afraid to tell people the difference that Christ has made in your life. Don't be afraid to say what you believe and why you believe it. Because you have a spirit not of fear and timidity, but of power and love and self control. And why can you have this strong and powerful spirit? Because, verse 9, this God of whom we speak has saved us already, has called us with a holy calling, not because of works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ before time began. And so you can sit here and you can be confident in your faith and you can be assured of your salvation and you can be strong in your convictions and you can have a powerful, dynamic, loving and self-controlled faith because before time began, God secured your salvation through a plan that would cost him his own son. Disciples of Christ are dynamic. They're powerful. They're unashamed. They're willing to suffer for the sake of the message that they've been given to proclaim. Paul, in prison, ready to be beheaded, writes a letter to this young man and says, son, don't be afraid. Be powerful and loving. Be convicted of the message you proclaim. Don't let someone blow out your candle. And if you feel as if the wick of your life has been submerged by the troubles and trials in life, place yourself in the company of those who haven't and watch as your flame comes back into existence. Fan into flame this gift of God that is yours through faith in Christ Jesus. You see, friends, 
discipleship is about community. Discipleship is about having a faith that is dynamic, not always in front of people, not teaching always, not always preaching, not, not necessarily leading anything, but sometimes it's being a lighted candle in the presence of someone who's grown dim. Dynamic faith is about burning your faith bright in the presence of those who live in a dark world. Have a dynamic faith. Have a faith that is willing to follow what Paul proclaims, what Jesus encourages. Have a faith that is dynamic and strong as you live your life for Christ so that others might come alive in him as well. Would you pray with me? Gracious Father, we give you thanks for giving us the ability to believe by infusing us with your Spirit. We thank you for saving us by sending your son to die and rise for us. We, we thank you for loving us enough to give up what was yours, that we might have it as ours. Father, we pray that you would be with us and give us a, a, a faith and a spirit that is strong and powerful and loving and, and self-controlled, that, that we might encourage one another, that we might lift one another up, that we might hold one another accountable, that, that we might never be ashamed of the message of the gospel that wherever we go, we might be strong in our proclamation and teaching of your grace and mercy and peace. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.